I was backpacking with my dog and about 12 miles from the road and trailhead. So pretty far from people, though popular enough that other hikers might be around. Though we saw no one all day. About 2 a.m., my dog started this really deep growl and wakes me up. I turn on my headlamp and see his teeth showing and he's right on top of me. I hear heavy footsteps near the tent. Maybe a black bear or moose. I leash my dog so he doesn't tear through the tent, and the footsteps move further away but keep circling my tent. All of my food and toiletries are hung in a tree in a bear bag. There's nothing in the tent to draw a bear's attention. I clap my hands. Something is still slowly circling. Not something a moose would do. And a bear might if he wanted food. But I've got nothing and a really big dog with me. I decide to step out of the tent with the leash in one hand and bear spray in the other, yelling, Hey bear. The footsteps stop. My dog's nose is in the air telling me to look right, but there's nothing in the light of my headlamp that I can see. I didn't hear anything run off, but it's quiet. I give it five minutes or so, get back in the tent, and it starts up again slowly circling maybe 50 feet from me. Maybe an hour later, I hear the footsteps wander off into the woods. At dawn, I take the dog and bear spray, and I start looking for tracks. I find a clear path in the leaves that have been trampled, but no tracks. The dog's nose is on the ground, and I follow his lead, and he follows the loop around our campsite. We finally see a few human footprints, not shoe tracks, a regular size bare human foot. And we also found that he used the toilet and some toilet paper. Some asshole was wandering around the middle of nowhere, near the tent and circling my tent for an hour or more, and used the bathroom for me to find. In August 2012, five friends and I rented a penthouse and stayed in San Jose del Cabo for a month. On our second day there, we rented a speedboat for a much-anticipated wakeboarding excursion. The majority of the ride was fantastic, dolphins and whatnot. We had a blast. We followed the shoreline from San Jose del Cabo to Cabo San Lucas. Midpoint in our trip, we went to flip a U in a harbor close to the Holiday Inn. Then, all hell broke loose. At the apex of our turn, we lost power. This means the front end of our boat was facing the beach, the back was facing the ocean. Now, if you're not familiar with the Mexican undercurrent, it's fast and the water deepens very quickly. The tide pulled us into the waves. With every surge, the water pushed the tail of the boat up while tilting the nose down, and as soon as I noticed that tilt, I knew impending doom was coming. Surely enough, the next push of water tilted the nose far enough down to be caught by the undercurrent, thus throwing me straight up into the air. At this point, the boat hadn't flipped yet. When the receding wave brought the boat back level, gravity returned me to my seat on the boat. I landed on my feet, but felt a shock up my back and an immediate, smashing warmth in my spine. Then bam, I fell forward in between the seats and couldn't feel a fucking thing below my chest. Meanwhile, the boat is on the verge of being flipped vertically. My friend Katie jumps on top of me and holds onto the railing with all of her strength so I don't fly off or get dragged away. Another wave pounds. This time, water slams into the boat, smacking Katie in the back. The force of the water pounds her nose right into the back of my head, breaking her nose. When this happened, I think I blacked out for a second. I'm a very strong swimmer, so when I finally felt the boat getting sucked out from under us, I remember thinking, I have to swim as hard as I can or I'm going to die. So I did. A local surfer, Juan, saw it all happen and swam out with his boat and helped me to the shore. 
My friend lost her wallet. I lost my re-entry visa. I lost my favorite dress in that damned accident, too. I spent the rest of the month and my budget for what would have been fishing, golfing, drinking, stuff with my friends, on food, tequila, hour-long massages, and Mexican over-the-counter pain pills. The doctors there were fantastic. I had a T5-7 to seven compression injury with bruising in my lumbar. He said I was extremely close to a serious injury. I still feel it five years later. I have PTSD from the accident for sure. Boats make me sweaty. This happened to me around six years ago. My family owns a flower slash produce shop and we travel to farmer's markets sometimes. Most of the family are not well enough to pick in the garden or do heavy loading, so we often hire people for the summers. My uncle hired this guy, Kevin. Kevin was in his late 30s, maybe early 40s. He was down on his luck. He was going through a divorce and needed some extra income. He was very nice. Almost too nice. He was actually camping on our land because his ex-wife-to-be was to have their house. At this time, I was 16 to 17 years old. Well, one day, he found me in an alcove-type spot where no one else was around and gave me his card with his personal number in case I wanted to ever hang out. He was very insistent that we should do it that day after work and kept pestering me for my phone number. I was immediately creeped out by this and politely told him we would see just to get him away from me. I immediately told my mom, who kind of brushed it off, but he gave me off vibes. A few days after this, he didn't show up to work. He was called a few times. After no contact whatsoever, we read in the newspaper a day or two later that he crashed his ex-wife's birthday celebration and tried to kill her. She drove to the nearest police station and he gave chase actually crashing into parked police cars in his haste. He's still in prison, and I'm just really glad I did not have to hang out with him. Back in 2020, I was living with my ex, and we lived in a shitty apartment. But later that year, he achieved his dream of being a homeowner, and we began the process of moving into the house. Well, one night he came home from work and decided he was done with the apartment, and we should pack what we had left and just move into the new house. So we packed up our pets and the rest of our stuff, and then moved in. This is where it gets creepy. It was probably about 9pm or so. My ex was inside the new house, setting up the internet, and I went out to the trunk of the car to get some stuff when I heard a woman screaming and calling a name. At first, I thought she lost her dog, but as she got closer, it sounded more like a kid's name. She was also frantic and then said the words, Come to mommy. So that's when it hit me. She had lost her kid. As she finally got into my view, I could see she was a woman with blonde hair. She was carrying a lawn chair and she was crying. At this point, I was making no attempt to conceal myself from the driveway and instead stared straight at her. I expected her to ask me for help since her kid was lost, and that's what I would do, but she didn't. She looked at me for a moment, then kept walking down the street, still crying and calling his name. I ran inside and told my boyfriend what happened. Apparently he could hear her from all the way inside, and he called the police. The cop wasted no time in getting there, but still, she walked fast, and by the time we saw the cop car, we couldn't hear her anymore. I don't know what happened after that. It was a strange welcoming to our new home, and it never happened again. I'm still not sure if she was really missing a kid or was just crazy, but her panic seemed genuine. What really creeps me out is how she didn't ask for my help. She just walked past me like I wasn't there. If you lost your kid, 
Wouldn't you be asking someone to call the police at least? I do wish I knew what happened. Hopefully she got her kid back or got the help she needed. Growing up, we lived in the projects. Our grandmother lived in the projects area, probably about a mile away from us. My younger brother and I went to take something to her, and then when we were on our way back home, it had started getting dark. We decided to take a shortcut, which meant walking through a dirt road, with a factory on the right and a wooded area on the left. There was almost no light in the area, so imagine an 11 to 12 year old boy and his 9 to 10 year old brother working up the courage to walk through the darkness to get to the main road. We started off walking quickly to make it through there, and I was pretty much holding my breath the entire time, because I didn't want to make noise. I didn't want whatever was out there to hear us. Finally, we made it out of the wooded dirt road and we turned right onto the sidewalk of the main road. We make it about ten feet, and suddenly we hear something behind us. I look back, and my brother does too. We see someone come out of the same dirt road we just come out of. We turn around, my heart pounding, and I say to my brother, They're following us. We need to hurry up. We still had a way to go to get home, and the only street light that we could see was down the road. I say to my brother while holding his hand, Walk faster. We hear the footsteps behind us start picking up speed as we are practically running. Once we notice this, I whisper, We're gonna run. Are you ready? Okay. Ready. Run. And I start running, almost dragging my brother behind me. It's probably all in my head, but I swear I hear the person behind us running too. We run past two cross streets and run up a little hill and make it to the traffic light. We stop and look back quickly. It's so dark, we don't see anything. We still think we're in danger, so we run across the street and have one more street to cross, and the project's area would be in front of us. We run the remainder of the way home. We don't want to be told we can't go anywhere again, so we don't say anything about being frightened and running all the way home. Thinking back to that time, our imaginations probably got the best of us. Or maybe we did escape. We'll never know. Okay, so this happened about 15 years ago. My sister-in-law Rose and her husband Bob had been married for around 17 years. They had two sons, Stuart and Michael. They lived in one of Scotland's new towns. One September day, I got news that Bob had died. It was sudden and totally unexpected. Of course there was the funeral. Then things settled down and we all got on with things. But this is where it gets strange. I was in bed one dark winter's night. They're pitch black dark at that time of year in Scotland, and sometime between 1 and 2 a.m. I woke up. As clear as day, Bob was standing next to the bed, short sleeve check shirt and all. He often wore these. Anyway, I looked at him and he looked at me and said, I don't want to be here. Then he shrugged his shoulders. He then said, Tell Rose I love her. Tell the boys too. I never saw him vanish into thin air or anything like that. He simply wasn't there after he said it. I never did tell her or give her the message, because she would have thought I was mad. The thing is, that was the third time something similar had happened. Weird, right? Was it really him, his ghost, or was it my mind playing tricks? For me personally, it was very, very real. This was a couple of years ago. I think I was 19 at the time. I was a cashier in a small grocery store. It was late. 
about 30 minutes until we closed, and there were only three other employees besides me. I was alone on the front end register, and this younger guy comes in and buys some produce. This guy is the only customer in the entire store, and I have no clue where my co-workers were. He ends up hanging around my register and eats some of his produce while he makes small talk with me. At first, I thought he was kind of funny, just a weird guy, but then he asked me if I had social media. I said no, because I'm not going to give this guy my contact information. He was like, why are you lying? And giggling a bit. I told him I wasn't, and then immediately his face grew stern and he said, why are you fucking lying, Jessica? It made me so uncomfortable. He was so aggressive about it. I just said I wasn't, and then he changed the topic. He started talking about being in a criminal organization in some South American country. I can't recall which, but he talked about smuggling drugs and people. And then he went into detail about how they would chop people's hands and fingers off. By this point, he was back to being giggly. I had an awful gut feeling, and I felt so scared. He kept getting closer and closer to me as he talked, and eventually he was on my side of the register, and I had moved away from where I was originally standing. He kept talking to me for about 30 minutes, and the entire time I was completely alone. No other customers came in, and my co-workers were not on the floor. I tried making an excuse to call my manager to come down to me, but he literally told me he was busy and hung up on me. This guy was so creepy and he kept trying to get personal information from me and wouldn't leave me alone. I was so afraid to say anything that would make him notice I was uncomfortable because I don't know what his intentions were or how he would react because he was clearly unstable. Finally, after what felt like forever, my manager came down to close the store and I ran so fast upstairs and just started sobbing because I was so scared. I never saw him again, thank God, but I had a bad gut feeling that his intentions were not good. The way he was trying to corner me, pry for information, and weirdly gloat about violent crime he partakes in. A few years ago, I was finishing up my masters. One night, before a particularly horrid evening class, a friend from school and I decided we would grab some ice cream beforehand to help us get through the class. I picked her up from her apartment, and we went to a cold stone just down the street from the building where our class was. It was a busy, albeit small, strip of shops. We got our ice cream and came out to sit in my car to eat it, as there was nowhere to sit outside. As we're walking back to the car, we hear a man call out from behind us and say, Excuse me, in a somewhat panicked voice. We turn around and it's a man in a suit. He's probably in his forties. The suit doesn't look like it fits him very well. He had no backpack or laptop bag, and he looks panicked and hurried, but he was clear-eyed and fully aware of his surroundings. He says, do you girls know where the train station is? I'm supposed to catch this train in 20 minutes. We tell him yes. The train station is about a 10 minute walk from where we were, and we gave him directions. Now, mind you, we're in a very busy area, full of Ubers, Lyfts, and cabs, and we're in a busy parking lot where tons of people are coming and going. His walk, at a leisurely pace, would be 10 minutes so he's got plenty of time to get over there, and he wasn't out of shape at all. We turn around and start walking to the car again, and he said thanks, and it seemed like the conversation was over. The next thing we know, he's following us to the car, and when we turn around to see if he's still there, he says, Could you girls do me a favor? If I promise to be nothing but an upstanding gentleman, could you take me to the train station so I don't miss my train? Now, a few things don't add up here. This area we are in is known for all types of white-collar business, but everyone has a bag of some sort, especially if they're taking mass transit. Also, he looked out of place in the suit, 
and the way he asked us for the ride made our red flags go up. Why do you need to preface that you'll promise to be an upstanding gentleman if you are one? While he's asking us about the train station and for the ride, several single men walked to their cars, got in and left, including one of the cars next to ours where we were standing. Why didn't he approach one of them? The whole situation felt off. My friend and I were definitely on the same page, and unlucky for this guy, we're both master students in forensic psychology, so we're about to go to a class where we talk about people, mostly men, luring, assaulting, torturing, and killing people in attempts for us, the student, to better understand their psychological mindset. So, even more so than the average person, we're going to have our guard up about strangers approaching us. We unsurprisingly told him, that's sorry, we couldn't help. We had to get to class and that he could grab an Uber, Lyft, or cab pretty quickly, or walk and we'd hoped he'd make it. Instead of saying thanks and walking off, he hung his head very dramatically in defeat and said, I shouldn't know. If you were my daughters, I wouldn't have wanted you to give me a ride. And he walked off in the opposite direction, of where we told him the train was. I often think about this whole scenario. Maybe he was just late and panicked asked the first people he saw, got nervous about asking us, and therefore asked poorly. But so many red flags piled on, and my friend and I both independently thought the situation was very odd when we talked about it afterwards. If he was up to some shady behavior, the audacity to try for two women at once in a busy parking lot in broad daylight was disturbing to say the least. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., so I always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house because he was gone during the times when he would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was a weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and coming out from our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock, and it was around 2.30 a.m., and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Of course, now this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked down, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys who'd been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, we see the men return and they begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog is still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards, 
and still knocking while the dog was barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walk away, and we all shuffle across the kitchen into the family room to peek out of the windows into our driveway, which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where did those guys go? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house, which enters the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying, David, as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point, two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police, and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return knocking at the front door. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by, and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased, and then proceeded to fall on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So random men at our door in the middle of the night. Let's not meet again. I used to be a district court prosecutor in my rural county. Sometimes it's stressful, but almost always entertaining. To set the scene, on a normal court day, I would call 40 or so scheduled cases before the judge for things like charges of plea, sentencing, probation, violations, and other matters. With 40 defendants, onlookers, police, court personnel, and a gaggle of lawyers, it was always barely controlled chaos. I always tried to make it as efficient as possible by calling cases that would take the least time first. Occasionally, an attorney would whisper in my ear that their client needed to be called quickly. If they didn't abuse the privilege, I would accommodate. Usually, their client had health issues, needed to pick up kids, and that kind of thing. The day in question, I was at the start of the docket, and I heard a ruckus through the doors to the hallway. Not common, but also not unheard of. A lawyer comes up and says his client's case needs to be handled right away. No other explanation. Enter the meth addict. I've been doing the job long enough to recognize the signs of its use. This guy had all of them. Scrawny guy with small open wounds on his face. Sunken cheeks. Darting eyes. The whole enchilada. I called his case. The guy's obviously physically tense, extremely agitated, and overly loud. Great. He's on meth right now. Flashback. Unbeknownst to me, he'd been wandering around the building with no shirt on, shouting nonsense to inmates behind the security windows. The security deputies knew he was a problem, so Deputy X escorted him into the courtroom. The scene of the crime. 
Deputy X stations himself between the addict and the judge's bench. The addict starts shouting and cursing, and the newly elected judge is having trouble keeping order. The shouting continues, and he starts telling the judge, Fuck you. Fuck the police. While coming around the table, Deputy X is 220 pounds of middle-aged country boy, body armor, weapons, and gear. This isn't his first rodeo. He tells the guy to step back and shut up. He complies, then strangely calmly pours himself a glass of water from the table. We talk about his case a little more, and he ramps back up in agitation and comes around the table again. Deputy X steps up to him and the addict throws a glass of water in Deputy X's face. Deputy X looks like a bear that had just been poked with a stick. True to form, he bear hugs the water assailant and gets him cuffed surprisingly quickly, considering the thrashing and yelling. He begins manhandling the guy out of jail for felony assault on an LEO and calls for backup. Deputy X and Deputy Y get him out of the courtroom and I continue on with another day in courtroom two. The attempted swan dive onto Marvel. This part was later relayed to me by Deputy Y. After getting him out of the courtroom, Deputy X and Y are dragging the guy past the balcony that overlooks a 20-foot drop onto a wide marble staircase. He rears up and attempts to flip all three of them off the balcony. It's 130 pounds of meth-fueled rage against 400 pounds of deputies that don't feel like having their heads bashed in after a swan dive into marble. Deputy Y sweeps the guy's legs, and he does his best impression of a pancake with 400 pounds of pissed-off deputy on top of him. It's honestly amazing no bones were broken. Then they escort him to booking, and here's the aftermath. After two weeks in big boy timeout, thinking about what a naughty boy he's been, the guy returns to court under the watchful eye of Deputy X. He'd already been charged in superior court for felony assault on an LEO. The bailiff had thoughtfully removed the water pitcher from the table. The guy is much better behaved this time. As I talk to the judge about his case, I casually pour a glass of water on my separate table and gently nudge it in the direction of the attic, but it's well out of his reach. I lock eyes with Deputy X, and with a stone face, he gently shakes his head. No. After court, Deputy X in private says, You asshole, with a laugh. Innocent is plausible, I said. What? You look thirsty. In the end, the guy pled down the felony assault to a misdemeanor, and did some time for it. As far as I know, he's still out there doing shirtless things. Thanks for listening. I hoped you enjoyed a little slice of my life as a rural prosecutor. A few years ago, I was house-sitting. Well farm sitting for the family of a friend of mine who's one year younger than me. She was moving to college at the north end of the state and the whole family was going to move her into her new dorm. The family is mom, dad, her, and five younger siblings, so this relatively small farm is usually well staffed. They easily have eight to ten acres of usable land in southeastern Indiana with horses, a large garden, chickens, goats, rabbits, and whatnot. Oh, and like four dogs, one of which is a huge mastiff mix or something like that. This dog is huge, like literally the size of a full-grown bear. It's the same color and isn't friendly with most people because he's very protective of the land. Herein lies part of the reason I was watching their house. For whatever reason, this dog loved me and I was willing to come out to their place a day early to learn all of the daily chores that I would need to do. To help develop an image of this place, you can see the house of their nearest neighbor from their front porch, but it's across the horse pasture up the gravel road you come in on, and easily a kilometer or two away. I think it would probably take a solid 15 to 20 minutes to diligently walk there. Anyway, 
so I spent one night there with them after spending a day learning the do's and do nots, and that was fine. They left early the next morning, and I got to work, which took about two hours on my own. The job was honestly really easy once the daily chores were finished. Pretty much just sit around and relax, accompany the dogs, bring in the mail and whatnot. The first night came quickly, and I'd heard their drive went well, so I spent the evening on the couch watching TV with the dogs. My sleeping arrangements were also in the living room on a futon, so I was half-sleepily lounging around and, at some point, I must have dozed off. I woke up to the beast of a dog laying his head on my chest at about 3am in the pitch black dead of night. My first thought was he needed to go outside, so I got up and put on my shoes. But that's when I noticed he'd gone from my side to cowering and whining in the corner of the house opposite the front door. I stood up to check on him and then realized it was really cold especially for a college-aged guy my size wearing pajama pants and a t-shirt in early August. This chill was accompanied by the most eerie feeling of dread that I've probably ever experienced to this day. I found it physically difficult to walk, as it felt like time was moving slowly. However, I eventually made it to the dog and pet him a few times to try and calm him down, but he seemed inconsolable. I walked to the thermostat in the hallway and read 37 degrees Fahrenheit inside, even though the outside temperature was easily still in the 70s. I moved towards the front door and peeked outside through a window, but there was a light cloud cover and it was so dark that I couldn't see anything. So I flipped on the porch light. The light wasn't enough to see very far into the pasture, so I wasn't too concerned that I couldn't see the horses but I could see much of the driveway area, and right in the midst of it stood a cloaked humanoid figure that seemed completely unfazed by the porch light. I froze. Whatever it was didn't seem aggressive and wasn't carrying any obvious weapons, but I'm thoroughly convinced after staring at it for five or ten seconds that this thing was not human. The father of my friend is low-key one of those doomsday preppers, but more realistic in that he prepares for things like EMPs, nukes, solar flares, and whatever else. Nonetheless, he has a shit ton of firearms around the house, all thoroughly locked up outside of my use, except one fully loaded 9mm pistol in the master bedroom that he gave me the key for and told me it was for emergencies only. I ran to the room as fast as I could and got the pistol, but by the time I returned to the door, the figure was gone. I saw that the dog was still in the corner, but he'd stopped whimpering for the time being. I turned on a bunch of lights in the house, still carrying the pistol, and returned to the couch where the dog had moved to while I was walking around. I was still shaking and completely unsure of what to expect next. But then, just as suddenly as everything else happened, the feeling of dread subsided. The dog wagged his tail a couple of times and licked my hand, and the thermostat now read a comfortable 72 degrees Fahrenheit, even though the heater had never kicked on. I managed to gather my thoughts and lay down again after about 20 to 30 minutes of deep breathing. I eventually fell asleep again. I woke up to my alarm at something like 8 a.m., and realized what I hoped to be a dream. Couldn't have been because all the lights were still on, and the pistol was sitting on the coffee table with the safety off. I eventually worked up the courage to step outside and start my chores, but I couldn't help to investigate the driveway a bit, near the place I thought the thing would have been standing. I found the shape of two bare feet, with no footprints leading to or from it and no other marks one would expect in a footprint. I have no idea to this day what it was that stood outside the door that night, nor do I have any explanation for the entire event. All I know is it spooked me enough that I invited my brother to come spend the subsequent and final night with me, where luckily nothing happened. I never told my friend or her parents, because I thought for sure they'd think I was crazy, and stop associating with me. 
Unfortunately, I've sort of lost contact with them now anyway. Maybe I'll reach out to them sometime. But I don't know. I really discovered a love for walking over lockdown. There were days where I could spend hours out traveling the country roads, across fields and through the woods. I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Ireland, so the walks were a great form of exercise without using a gym. It started with me and my dad going out for about an hour every day, but he knew I wanted more and told me to go on my own if he wasn't up for it or if I wanted to go further than usual. It was around July of 2021. I was 14 at the time, and even though lockdown was starting to ease, I still went walking. I decided to walk through the fields instead of the roads, because having to stop for cars really irks me. I came to a plot of land with trees planted and decided to splash the boots before turning back. I was almost finished when I started hearing laughter from behind me. I pulled up my zip and buckled my belt to face whoever was there. I was surprised to see five people. None of them could have been much older than me. One of them waved and I walked towards them. They were between me and my way back home, so I sort of had to. The group had been talking amongst themselves, but stopped when I met them. There were three boys and two girls. They all had bags or backpacks and were all similarly dressed in dark graphic t-shirts and black cargos with funny looking keychains. A bit of a weird sight considering things like skate culture aren't really big where I'm from and anyone who's ever owned a nice piece of clothing wouldn't wear it out in a place where they could trip up and cowpat. The guy with the thrasher t-shirt smiled and asked, what are you doing out here? I realized it must have been a bit weird to meet a stranger in the absolute asshole of nowhere, so I just said, I'm taking a shortcut through the back road. Another boy chimes in and said, Don't lie, Colchi. I saw you taking a piss in the woods. It dawned on me that they were both too well-spoken to be anyone local. I felt a bit intimidated, so I just told him, Nature was calling, as jokingly as I could, to which they all laughed. I wasn't sure if it was my accent that they found funny, or the fact that they'd caught me, and I was made visibly embarrassed. One of the two girls breaks from the laughter and pulls a face of disgust. Oh, for fuck's sake, what are you doing with that necklace? Referring to the cross necklace I was wearing. It didn't really scan with me how serious she was. So I just let out a chuckle, but the four others stopped laughing. The girl who spoke pulled out a book from the tote bag she'd worn over her shoulder, and she said, You've probably already ruined this by pissing on the ground too, as if I was supposed to know what this was. The five of them all genuinely looked gutted, as if I genuinely ruined their day. I just responded with, I don't really know what you mean. And a bleeding noise came out from the thrasher guy's bag. I looked at him, and the group starts to act skittish. The girl with the book says, Let's just look for a good spot. And they walk past me. I turn and see the thrasher guy's backpack look sort of lumpy. At the time, I really didn't know what was in there. But as I was nearly home, I walked past a field with sheep and I realized they stole an animal from one of the farms. I told my parents later that day I was away cycling. I took the bike as far as I could and jogged to where I last saw the group disappear into the trees. I looked around. There was a dead lamb with several shallow gashes all over it, with some of its wool almost pulled out. The number five and blue spray paint was still partially visible, I'm guessing that they left it there after cutting it, and it bled out and died. I don't believe in that satanic, panic, antichrist thing, but I know they were probably sacrificing the lamb for some reason or the other. 
I was helping my friend, who I told this story to, with farmhand work the week after, and all of his livestock were accounted for, meaning I have a rough idea of which field they got the lamb. But I didn't want to ask the owner, in case he thought I had something to do with it disappearing. Me and my friend went back to the wooded area because I didn't want him to think I was messing with them. But I haven't gone back since. We were leaving a wedding we had attended that was held about three hours from home. My boyfriend had stayed sober in order to drive us home. I was pretty drunk. As we were driving the dark country back roads to get back to the city, I was half dozing and remember squinting because there seemed to be bright headlights washing over us. And then my boyfriend, who was driving, started screaming. Like full on screaming, I've never heard him do so before or since. It wasn't a loud high pitched screaming, but a deep in the throat screaming that broke in and out and that left him hoarse. He swerved our car sharply to the side of the road, nearly into a ditch. I fully woke up and asked, What? Are you okay? He said that he saw a truck coming full bore towards us in the dark and honestly thought we were going to die. I looked behind us, a long straight road with no houses or street lights. There was no sign of a truck or any kind of vehicle, no rear headlights on the road or any light from a truck's headlights which we would have seen. No sound of truck or car or anything, but he was shaking, and I initially brushed it off as him maybe falling asleep at the wheel, which is already scary in and of itself. We were on a narrow country road. There was no way a massive truck could have gone by us without hitting our car for one, and I don't remember feeling the rumble and vibrating of our car that would have happened if a truck had narrowly missed us. So I dismissed it. He still swears that he saw a massive truck coming towards us. However, I do remember a flood of headlights hurting my half-closed eyes just before my boyfriend freaked out. This happened when I was in downtown LA. I was crossing the street and just came up onto the sidewalk. Some guy in a Ferrari steps out of the car, walks up to me, and tries to swing on me in broad daylight. I sidestep the guy, and he spun around to try and hit me again, calling me a motherfucker and not to dodge. I caught him with a nut shot with my foot and doubled him over. His buddy hops out of the car, and another of his buddies gets up from the side of the sidewalk and are both yelling at me. I'm like, oh fuck, I'm not ready for this. These absolute legends who had been watching all this shit go down just appear out of nowhere and jump these guys for me, like six different people from out of the wet work. Nutshot and Scrub, the Ferrari guys, hop in the car and just take off, scraping the car and taking the right side view mirror off. Their other homeboy gets left behind, but he tries to stumble fuck his ass away after having taken a couple hits to the head. One of the guys who helped me jogs up and punts this guy in the side right after he falls over, doubling him over. Meanwhile, everybody else is checking on me and making sure I'm good. The cops show up, detain us, figure out what's going on, let us go and arrest the guy that couldn't get away. I come to find out that these guys had been doing this for weeks, and the people who'd helped me were local residents who'd been on the lookout for Nutshot. The guy that was arrested later squealed, and all the guys involved got a couple of years for aggravated assault. This happened around summer 2000 in Midwest USA, and I was a 12-year-old boy. I was shy and never did well with confrontation. Anytime I was scared, I'd feel myself shaking. One day, 
My dad and cousin were weightlifting in the garage and it was open. I then decided to grab my bicycle out of the garage and ride it up and down the street while my dad and cousin lifted. As I'm pedaling away from my house, I see another kid riding his bike probably five to six houses down from mine, but he's just kind of going in circles. I maybe get like 20 feet near him, but that's it. No words were exchanged, not even a wave or a nod. I just kept my head down and kept pedaling. On my next circle back down the street, that's when things got weird. I get near the area where the kid had been riding, and he's not around anymore so I guessed he went inside wherever he lived. Right as I'm about to turn around and head towards my house, which is probably 80 to 100 yards away, I hear a man yell, Hey! in an unsettling tone. I look up, and a man is standing in his front doorway, probably 25 feet away from me. As I'm paused on the street with my bike, he's one of the creepiest looking guys I've ever seen in my life. He has on a ball cap, and he's wearing these thick, Jeffrey Dahmer-looking glasses. Tan, burnt orange, dirty-looking wrinkled skin, and he had to be in his 40s probably. He looked straight out of a horror movie, and he just had this sinister, angry look on his face. He then says, If you say anything to my son again, I'm going to run your ass over. At this point, I was crying and frozen with fear, but then I started biking home faster than ever. I'd never been in a situation like this in my life. I couldn't believe what happened because I never said anything to that boy. So I get to the open garage where my dad and cousin are still lifting. I tell them the story and they decide to go to this guy's house and address the situation that just occurred. My dad and cousin had a few beers and are pretty jack, so they were ready to tussle if needed. My dad goes straight to this guy's door with my cousin behind him and knocks loudly. The man opens the door and has this huge Rottweiler by his side, barking and going crazy at my dad and cousin. He threatens to let the dog loose, but my dad and cousin aren't cowering one bit. After a bit of bickering for a minute, the guy goes inside his house and shuts the door. Nothing else happens that night, and we walk back home. A few days pass, and now I'm about to get to the creepiest part. During the summer, when my parents worked during the day, my grandma would come over and babysit my little brother and I. We were about 10 minutes from downtown, and my grandma was going to take us there to grab food at Sonic. We get in her car and start driving down the road towards that creepy guy's house. This made me feel uneasy, but that's the direction we had to go. As we get closer to the house, the hair on my neck starts to stand up again. As we go by the house, I see him. He's sitting in a red truck in his driveway, facing the road like he's about to pull out. I don't remember well, but I think he might have even had a grin on his face when we drove by. We pass the house, and he pulls out behind us. I start freaking out a bit, so I tell my grandma the story about the man driving behind us. At first my grandma was chill about it, but then I noticed she seemed a bit shaken. This is because she'd made about six to seven turns to throw him off our trail, but he kept following us. Every little turn. At this point, me and my brother are in the back seat with our heads down as he follows us, but luckily we made it downtown where it was quite busy. We're close to the police station, I believe, and take another turn. Then he finally just passes on by. I never saw that man again. My mom and dad split up, and we left that neighborhood two years later with my mom to move to the country. My dad still lives at the same house, and I wonder if that guy stuck around for a while, or even still lives at that same house. What was his intent? Was it just a coincidence? Or did he plan on following us? It was so weird how it looked like he was just waiting in his driveway for us to pass by. So the other night, I was working this post that was pretty much shut down with roadblocks up to check any and all personnel that do try to enter the facility. 
Both roads that lead to my gate were blocked off less than half a mile just north of me, and another a little over two miles to my southwest, around a bend that was completely out of sight. Well, the one just north of me, when people do pull up to it late at night, the headlights will just be visible down by me on my cameras. I was sitting there drinking some coffee and trying to keep myself awake. I'd hardly seen anybody. My sight was inactive due to what we call a hard down, with only essential personnel being granted entry. A truck had just come pulling up to the guard shack just north of me as I watched on camera, and as the truck is pulling up and coming to a stop, I see a reflection in the camera that I thought was just the lights of the truck, until I opened my eyes a bit wider to focus. I saw it move. What it looked like was a complete silhouette of a person, and I thought maybe somebody was walking up to my gate in the dark, and it made me jump out of my seat to look out the front window to confirm a visual. As I'm looking out, I see absolutely nothing, and I look back to the monitor, and there it is on screen. The silhouette of a man that looks to be wearing a hazmat suit. I kept looking back and forth from the window to the camera, and as I'm doing this in live time, I'm just catching glimpses of what the camera is picking up. I radio the other two guards, asking if they'd let any personnel get through their checkpoints. I get a negative response back, asking me what's up. I told them to stand by as I review what I just saw on the recordings. To my absolute disbelief, I watched, stunned. As the truck comes pulling to the north guard shack, its lights shine on some movement. What I could make out was a silhouette figure of a man wearing a hazmat suit walking. When the truck comes to a stop, the man also stops. The man looks towards the truck, does a double take from me to the truck, and just walks across the road and disappears. I thought I was going crazy and maybe seeing things because of my lack of sleep. I clipped and saved that portion of the video and waited till shift change to show the other guards I worked with over the night and the ones coming to relieve us. I never said anything about that night or anything to the guards coming on shift and I played the clip for them. Everybody's jaw dropped and saw exactly what I did without me pointing anything out. This is a regular occurrence. Out here, most of the guards that have been here a while have seen things and have stories. I just got what I've been waiting for. Solid proof for myself. I work at a jewelry store in a small mall somewhere remote in Canada. It's a fun job. I love my co-workers, love the customers and love the fixed schedule working in a mall gives me. It's nice to know I'll be off by 6pm every night. Gives me plenty of time to socialize and study outside of work. The mall is a single loop with probably around 50 stores operating on average. They employ a staff of about 30 people to keep the mall operating. Half of this staff works admin, the other 15 or so work security. As a regular 40-hour-a-week employee, I've had my fair share of interactions with security. Having them escort me to the bus stop, on the occasional night inventory had me working late, or calling them into the store to help me deal with an irate customer. Over the years, I became acquainted with a few of the security guards. My favorites were Will, April, and Mark. Will was the friendliest. He'll pop his head into my store and say good morning to me when I'm opening. April was the most, by the books, security guard. She usually helped me deal with difficult customers. Mark was one of the evening security guards, so my only interactions with him were escorts late at night to the bus, during which he was quiet but polite. The schedule shuffle last year put Will on parking lot patrols, April mostly on evening shifts and put Mark on day duty. Not the end of the world, just kind of sucked no longer having a friendly conversation with Will as I opened the store, and not having badass April around to step in 
when customers get unruly. Mark was a lot more quiet than his two counterparts and just wasn't quite as friendly. I didn't interact with him much for the first few months after this new schedule started. I'd give him a smile as he walked by my store and it helped him out a few times with shoplifters. But beyond that, nada. No great friendship blossoming out of the schedule rotation or anything. About two months after the schedule had changed, I had my first bad encounter with Mark. I was walking through one of the mall staff hallways to take a washroom break. Mark happened to be walking just ahead of me, also going to the washroom. When we reached the doors, he looked me up and down and then remarked, This is going to be hard. I got a bit of a chill when he said that, but assumed there was an issue in the men's washroom. Someone passed out in a stall or something, so I asked him, Oh no, why? Because I'm nosy, and was excited to have a bit of mall gossip to share with my co-workers. He got a cold, distant look in his eyes and said, My doctor advised against heavy lifting, and then he winked at me. I ran into the girls' washroom and texted my manager, freaking out about what he just said, knowing full well what he implied with that remark. Mark is a 45-year-old man with graying hair and a bit of a beer gut. He stands around 6 foot 2. I'm a tiny 5 foot 7 girl who was about 20 at the time of this. It creeped me out so much that I reported it to April, my next shift, who promised me she would handle it. I stopped seeing Mark doing patrols and assumed he'd been switched back off of day shift. For about two weeks, I'd heard nothing from him or any of the other security guards. I was just about to end my shift one evening, with about 15 minutes left before we closed for the day. I hear someone enter my store and look up to see Mark walking towards me with just a look of pure hate on his face. I wasn't working alone so I stepped into the back room to avoid dealing with him. It didn't work. Mark threw the door to my back room open and stood there, screaming his lungs out at me. How it was my fault he'd lost his job, how I'd ruined his life, and how I was going to pay for my mistake. He viewed the sexual comment he made as a joke and thought I was a bitch straight from hell for reporting him. He screamed for a few minutes, and the second he paused for breath, I calmly told him to get out of my store because I was calling the cops and security. He ran out of the store, and a moment later, Will sprinted in. He just screamed at me, Where the fuck did he go? And I pointed as I started to cry. I was shaking from the confrontation as I gave my statements to the police and mall security. Mark had been fired after my report but security was adamant that it wasn't my fault. Mark had racked up a bunch of complaints over his years, and it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. He was banned from mall premises the day he got fired and criminally trespassed when he came in to scream at me. Authorities issued a warrant for him, and it took weeks for him to reappear and be arrested. During those weeks, I was very scared. Mark knew what bus I take. Mark knew my work schedule. Mark hated me. Every time I turned a corner, I was scared he'd be there. I believe he's out of jail now. A few days ago, my girlfriend and I were on the home stretch of a big road trip with our dog, as it had been a while since we last stopped, we pulled into a rest stop off the freeway to stretch our legs and let the dog go to the bathroom. When we pulled into the rest stop, there were no cars and three big semi-trucks parked in a line. Immediately, my girlfriend got out to go to the restroom. I leashed up the dog and stood next to the car, and as she was walking towards the entry door, I thought I heard someone yell behind me. To my surprise, it was a trucker in the driver's seat of his truck with a window rolled down, trying to get my attention. Now, I'm generally pretty friendly towards all people, whether they seem shady or not, 
generally willing to help a hand. Behind me in the truck was an older gentleman, large, with gray hair and sunglasses. His truck was so loud, I couldn't hear what he was yelling, so I yelled back, What? The trucker yelled something inaudible three more times as I asked him, What? While shaking my head and holding up my hands to inform him, I couldn't hear him. At this point, he seemed visually annoyed that I said, What? Four times. Okay, understandable. I wanted to see what the deal with this guy was, so I walked between the car and the passenger side of his truck. What did you say? I asked. Can you help me look for my phone? I lost it somewhere, the trucker said. At this point, I was caught off guard, as this had all unfolded within 20 to 30 seconds that we parked at the rest stop. To me, it was weird that a trucker was asking a random passenger stopping at a rest stop to help look for their phone, but maybe he just wanted me to call it. Where did you lose it at? I asked. I lost it in my truck. Can you come up here and help me look for it? The trucker replied in an unnerving tone. In that moment, I was sketched the fuck out. I thought I was about to be abducted. Phone call I could do, but there was no way I was about to get into this trucker's cab to look for his phone. Yeah, no, I said sternly, but half-heartedly, as I almost thought this guy was joking with me. After a few moments, the trucker then says, You won't help me look for it. My adrenaline was pumping, so I yelled back, Get out of here, in a threatening tone, knowing damn well I had nothing to defend us should something go wrong. I put the dog back into the car and pulled out my phone to pretend I was calling the cops, while he slowly drove and stopped again to ask if I was going to help. I then screamed again, No, get the fuck out of here, I'm calling the cops. After that reply, he stepped on the gas and exited to the freeway. I stood and watched. When finally my girlfriend exited the rest stop, wondering why I looked like I just saw a ghost. I don't know if it was an overreaction, but it sketched me the fuck out that he asked me to get into the truck. When I was nine, we were traveling from our cabin back to town with an open boat. This was right before Easter, about a 45 minute trip. The seas were rough and the boat had a built in flaw that caused it to break into two pieces due to the pounding on the waves. I sat face towards the back so I didn't see it break. There was just suddenly water up to my waist. When I turned around, the nose was floating a couple of meters away from the boat. My mom's husband at the time just said, jump, and so we did, into the black two degree water of the North Sea, as far away from the boat as possible. This was by far the scariest moment. Her husband managed to launch two emergency rockets before the boat vanished below him. He was a very poor swimmer, and even though we tried to hold on to him, he was separated from us due to the large waves constantly covering us. After that, it was about 10 minutes of trying to swim to the shore, which was about 400 meters away, before realizing we were never going to make it. After that, we basically dodged waves and made bad taste jokes. We saw people on the shore, cars stopped on the highway. The last thing I remember before blacking out is a boat approaching. Then I woke up in the hospital, basically thrashing around from the cramps of my body trying to warm up. Apparently I had a temperature of 27 degrees when they brought me in. My mom was awake the whole time. She lost control of her limbs right after I blacked out and gripped a rope from my life vest with her teeth so I wouldn't float away. Even though this was scary to me, there are some awesome elements to it. An old fisherman in a house by the shore saw the whole thing. He was desperately trying to get a hold of rescue services, but no one was where they were supposed to be. His wife, having lost both her previous husband and a son at sea, 
had some kind of health issue while watching us swim around, so he had to take care of her and try to get us some help. The most badass part of the story is how we got rescued. One of my mom's husband's friend got a call about what was happening. He got in his boat with his eight-month pregnant wife and went full speed to our location. The boat he had was not designed for high seas. It was a summer-type cab cruiser, so he had to steer it towards the waves at all times. His wife then proceeded to pull three fully clothed people back up to safety, including an unconscious me. If anyone has ever tried to pull someone out of the water, you know how difficult it is. We all survived. I was totally fine, aside from my ball swelling up to three times the normal size for a couple of days. My mom tore a bunch of stuff in her back, and her husband swallowed about four liters of salt water and was sick for about a week. I lost my mom to cancer a couple of years back. Well, a couple of years after, my brothers and I were visiting my dad in their house over the December holidays. It's a small place, so since there wasn't much sleeping room, I was to sleep in the lounge area. The front of the apartment was open plan and connected to the kitchen, and in the kitchen, on the fridge, was this little Pikachu fridge magnet, which is still there and when pressed on its belly, it would say Pikachu. It's more than 15 years old, but still working. I was a Pokemon fanatic as a kid, so, in the middle of the night, with everyone asleep, this thing starts going off like crazy. At first, I thought it had to be my brothers playing some stupid trick on me, so I sit up straight and look over to the fridge, but there's nobody even near it. I get up to go check it out, but as I get closer, it stops. I'm still groggy, so I'm like, whatever, and I head back to bed. I fall asleep again, and a while after, I'm woken up by the sound again. This time, though, as I sit up, there's the figure of a woman wearing a nightgown standing at the foot of my bed, one just like my mom had, and there was an icy cold hanging in the air like almost burning my face cold. She looks at me and in a confused voice says, This is my house, right? Which makes sense because she was very confused during her last couple of months. Her personality deteriorated very fast. I completely froze. But at that moment, I hear footsteps from the hallway side and she vanishes. As I'm sitting there trying to process what just happened, my brother walks into the room, turns on the light, and sees me pale as the ghost I just saw. I apparently asked him if him and his wife were trolling me or something, but he actually got up to investigate the sound too. His wife was fast asleep. Now, being the logical guy I am, I did kind of figure out a scientific explanation for what happened. See... My older brother's kids had been over that day too, and they played around with the Pikachu. Also, all this went down in the summer, while it was very hot outside during the day. But when the sound started at night, it was cold as hell, so maybe the Pikachu's belly expanded during the day, and then shrunk to a point where some switch inside was making contact. As for my mother... We were spring cleaning that day and put up our favorite curtains that I remembered from when I was a kid. We also went through a couple of her heirlooms, so there's no doubt she was in my mind a lot. And I might have just been very groggy. But you know what? It just doesn't feel like one big coincidence. So last year, I was working as a line cook at a popular chain restaurant. I used to be done with my shift at around midnight, and I would promptly walk home because I only lived 20 minutes from my job. I live in Canada, so it's generally been no issue if I walk home by myself at night. So I'd been walking home by myself for two months, when one night I decided to go to the grocery store near my work. 
As I was walking there, a homeless man was hovering around me when I was waiting for the light to turn. He was close to me, but thankfully he kept walking in a direction opposite to where I was going. Unfortunately, when he was hovering around me, I was talking to my boyfriend and telling him I'm going to the grocery store. I got to the grocery store and didn't see him. After I finished my shopping, I see the man from earlier hovering around the grocery store entrance. He didn't go in, but he was waiting outside in the rain. When I looked at him, he stared back at me, so I decided to take an Uber instead of walking. As I waited for my Uber, I tried to hide behind some soil bags in the grocery store entrance, but then he found me and started to stare at me again. Finally, my Uber showed up and I got in. After that, I was too scared to walk home alone, so I got my boyfriend to walk me, or I would get a manager to drive me home. A few days later, my boyfriend and I are walking home and were leaving my workplace's parking lot. There was one big black van parked perpendicularly in the path I usually walk through. No other cars around. We see a man hovering around this car, and his side sliding door to his van is open. He's hovering around the door, so I found this weird. I make my boyfriend walk with me over to the sidewalk of one of the big stores. When we have our backs turned, he starts to follow us. I see this and I tell my boyfriend we need to run. We managed to run some lights and I didn't see him follow us. After that, I started taking Ubers or getting my managers to drive me home. Every Saturday night for five weeks, I would see a black van parked near my work and it would leave when it saw me leave with my manager. It would also leave when it realized that I saw it. For example, I was helping the bartender clean and I decided to look out one of the windows when I saw that damn van again. When it saw me staring back at it, it left thankfully. This scared me a lot so my manager started to give me the morning shifts, and when I had to go back to university and take late shifts again, I didn't see it anymore. Next time I do, I plan to go to the police. Not only that, I was already on high alert because one of my ex-co-workers had been showing up outside of my work. When I worked with him, he would blatantly stare at me and at one point brushed his waist against my arm when we had to work together on purpose. He would also stand very close to me at some points, almost touching me. I wasn't that worried about him because he's almost a decade younger than me and mostly just watched me. However, he was why I was paying more attention to my surroundings. Hence, it helped me look out for the other creeps. I grew up in southern New Hampshire. I had some interesting times in East Derry. I grew up on a cul-de-sac with a police captain and a detective as my neighbors. A lot of weird and strange things happened while living there, most connected to the house itself. I had a type of shadow person. It would take the shape of my family members, and years after moving from that house, my older brother would tell me, whatever it was liked you which brings us to one of my many stories. My best friend lived five houses from me, and her parents owned a pop-up camper. It was located to the side of their porch, which had the door that the family used as a main entrance. Being the young 12 to 14 year olds we were, we had many sleepovers in it with other kids in the neighborhood. We had a few experiences, and I will tell you the most haunting one of them. This night, it was just her and I. We're both girls and at that age where we would bicker over the dumbest things. This night, it was her throwing a piece of gum to me and it getting lost between one of the mattresses and the lining of the camper. She wasn't willing to give me another piece, which led us to butting heads. We were bickering back and forth about her giving me another piece when we both went dead quiet. All of a sudden, we both heard what sounded like footsteps walking around the camper. Then came the talking. I don't know how to describe it other than being right there, like a whisper but sounding so distant. It was a male, 
and we could not make out what it was he was saying. Whatever it was was in another language. We looked at each other with concern, and I remember her taking off her socks and us just making that 15-foot sprint to that side door, inside, and up the stairs to her room while grabbing the house phone on the way. Her parents were drunks, so we didn't wake them. Instead, we did the only rational thing and called my house. My mom ended up driving around the neighborhood two times, only to call us back and tell us she saw nothing. We were so freaked out that we slept on the floor next to each other. Where we slept was under the window that overlooked her front yard. I'm not sure when we fell asleep, but before we did, we both remember hearing the sound of raking and digging. This is a story going on almost 20 years ago now. I am, to this day, still friends with my childhood best friend. A lot of weird stuff takes place in Derry. I live in the deep woods in southern Missouri. The nearest civilization outside a trailer house down the road is a gas station town a couple of miles away. I've lived here since I was six months old and spent my days in the woods. I don't remember a time where I didn't know the winding paths and clearings like the back of my hand. There were always stories of something in the woods. A local tribesman told the tale of a spirit that wandered the woods at night. I was deeply invested in stories of ghosts and monsters and that sort of stuff, so the tribesman's tale was pretty run-of-the-mill. I didn't think much of it until a few years ago. One night in 2010, I was walking the usual trail and got a feeling that something wasn't right. It was like I was walking three feet behind my body. It was the sound of a snapping branch that brought my body and mind back together, but it wasn't a twig or small limb. It was a large oak branch about as wide as me. It hit the ground with a hard thud. After that, the woods became completely silent. No owls or coyotes howling. Not even the night breeze. The only sound was my own stunned breathing. Out of the darkness, two glowing yellow eyes looked directly at me from the shadows. They were several yards down the trail yet still seemed several feet off the ground. A low thundering growl came from the same direction. It was like the growl of a tiger mixed with a bear. I wanted to run back home, but my legs wouldn't budge. My breathing picked up and became more and more like gasping for air. The growling stopped as the creature started to turn around and go deeper into the woods, showing me its form in the moonlight. It didn't seem of this world. I can only describe it as a black mountain lion with a head and body the size of a grizzly bear. It looked like it hadn't eaten in a month and was nothing more than skin and bones. Only when I was alone again in the woods would my legs let me sprint back home and lock myself in my room with a survival knife. Occasionally, on the quietest nights of the year, I can hear it outside my window and the same eyes from that night appear out of the darkness. I never go outside without my knife anymore, even during the day. I've had several friends that have come over for the day go home that night and tell me how they feel like they're being watched from outside. I went to college in a historic, mid-sized city in Florida, and at the time lived in a duplex town, maybe three blocks from campus. The city is known to be pretty safe, and I lived in a pretty decent area with large, historic homes near me. This all happened around five years ago, for a bit of backstory that will become relevant. The duplex I lived in had a front door that locked and then both the upstairs and downstairs units had their own locking door. I lived downstairs and had two roommates, but this specific night, only one of my roommates was home. 
We knew the girls that lived upstairs, but only really spoke to them in passing. When they moved in, we emphasized how important it was to us for them to keep the main door locked, and they did a good job of doing so. So me and my flatmate are in for the night, knowing the front door is locked, and we smoked a few joints. At some point, we hear a knock at the front door and quickly realize the girls upstairs had ordered a pizza. Later on, it becomes evident that they never locked the front door after receiving their pizza. So we finally go to sleep in our rooms, and since I had a queen bed, I would often sleep with my phone and laptop next to me in my bed. A couple of hours after I fell asleep, I woke up to a man standing over my bed. As soon as I realized I wasn't dreaming, I noticed that he's quickly moving my phone and computer out of my bed and moving my comforter, trying to get into my bed. I start to ask him who he is, what he's doing there, and just generally confused, as I was still slightly high from before I went to sleep. The only thing he said to me was that he was just trying to get into bed. At this point, I begin to panic as my mind obviously goes to the worst. I was hoping that maybe my roommate had invited some random Tinder guy over and that he'd gone to the wrong room. But the more I questioned him, all he had to say was, I'm just trying to get in bed. I own pepper spray and a stun gun, but I'd accidentally left them on a shelf that the guy was standing in front of, so there was no way I would be able to grab them without escalating the situation. Realizing I needed to do something quickly, I blurted out, There are five people who live in this house, and if you don't get out of here now, I will scream, and they will be here within seconds. Luckily, that was all it took to scare him off. I don't know if he'd brought something with him or if he stole something from me, but I saw him grab something in the dark and run out of my room. As soon as he left my room, I shut the door and locked it. I tried to find my phone, I couldn't find it anywhere, but then quickly realized that between my room and the front door is the room of my friend that was home. As scared as I was, I was terrified that the guy had maybe gone into a room, so I grabbed my stun gun and a pocket knife, counted to three, and ripped open my door. I ran into my roommate's room, and she was fast asleep. There was no evidence of the guy. I told her what happened, and she asked me if I was sure I wasn't dreaming. I began to question myself, until I walked out of her room and saw that our front door was wide open. I went to my room to search for my phone, and finally found it hidden under a pile of clothes across the room from where I'd left it. That sent a chill up my spine, as I immediately knew for a fact someone had been in my house and room while I was sleeping, and long enough to hide my phone, which only worsened my suspicions of his intentions. I ran back to my roommate's room, who at that point believed me. We barricaded ourselves into the room and called 911. Within minutes, there were police cars swarming our street and yard. They yelled for us to quickly leave the residence and run towards them. At least a dozen police officers came running in and searched every inch of our apartment. They woke up the girls upstairs and searched their apartment to ensure the man had left. The officers then had me write a statement, and I gave them a description of the man. And to this day, I haven't heard a single thing about the case. I feel incredibly lucky with the outcome of the situation, but the thought of his intentions terrifies me, and additionally the fact that he was never caught scares me, as I would hate for anyone to have to go through the pure fear that I did. I will add, there is a chance that he was on drugs or mentally ill, and had no bad intentions. However, because he was never caught, I will never know, and my mind will always assume the worst. I've worked in restaurants for almost 10 years. I'm accustomed to getting out late. 
One night after finishing a double shift at a ramen spot, I had my usual beer and decided to get an Uber home. My Uber arrived. I checked the plate and all, and the gentleman even confirmed my name. I spent half of the ride almost dozing off. As the ride progressed, I noticed the driver kept staring at me through the mirror. He never said a single word, no expression. It was just a blank stare. I figured exhaustion and the beer had gotten the best of me, and he was probably staring because he thought I was drunk. Later on, I also noticed that he had taken a different highway and that we were making our way through Rikers Island. It was a route I wasn't accustomed to, but he had his way zap open, and I figured he was trying to take some sort of shortcut. We kept getting further into Rikers Island, and the area had become full of trees and construction machines, neon cones and cracked cement. He came to a sudden stop. My car just broke. Get out and call a new Uber. I was confused. There hadn't been any indication that a tire had popped or that it had ran out of gas. I got out, and before I asked anything, he stepped on the gas and sped off. The car was perfectly fine. Alone by a construction zone, I started freaking out and called another Uber. When he arrived, his first question was why I was in the middle of nowhere, especially so late. I told him about the other Uber driver, and he urged me to report it. I reported it check the profile. 4.8 stars. Same license plate, but it was not the same man in the picture. The report never really got anywhere. I can't help but feel I encountered something nefarious. This happened to me eight years ago. It was my first month on the job and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. For the record, I still work there and have more strange stories possibly to tell in the future. I'm a 38-year-old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life and the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well-known concert venues for years. So... I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. In other words, I don't scare easily and hardly ever go into panic mode when a crisis comes up. The place I currently work at is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartment with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in back indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers and real estate agents, and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It's located in a well-known tourist town in the U.S., the building itself has 12 exits on the first floor. The doors are locked at 11 p.m. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in, or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you're at. It will ring the company's cell phone, and I answer and come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors, which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on the first floor are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a coat to get in. This was midsummer and while it's not really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I'm the only security person here at night. My co-worker, who is leaving, told me the side iron gates that lead to the parking lot are open on one side, because they're stuck. This is nothing new, they do often get jammed. She told me the repair would be tomorrow sometime to fix them, 
but to just do some extra patrol out there that night. This place sits across the road from a public park, and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to breed druggies and homeless at night, who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm, nor can we detain anyone. We're simply eyes and ears, and to call the police if something comes up. Of course you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases, if you're in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I'm to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious watch the cameras in the security office, which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk, it was really quiet and it rolled around to 3 a.m. I had just sat down to eat my lunch when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, Thanks for calling Bluestone. This is Security Officer James. How can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of arm reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked, how can I help you? The man started to breathe heavier and laugh, and in silence. It was one of those laughs you hear in a movie where the lunatic is about to do something terrible. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office and to the door he was at when it rang again, this time from call box number two, which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you and you're gonna die, the voice said in a raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. The phone rang again. This time I picked it up, and before he could speak, I let him know that the cops were on their way, and to leave the property now as he's on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. This guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box as they're a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you. Are you ready to die? The cops won't make it here in time, the guy said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver, and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police, but honestly, the location of this place, it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here, and I figured this guy was just some tweaker from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked to the back lot, just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case, but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. About a half hour passed. I had finished lunch and just was about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time, it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked it up and said my normal line. Where are the cops? I don't see them, but I see you, the voice said. Fuck, it was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and didn't see anything, 
I went to the front door to look out, and there was nothing but darkness and a few floodlights on. I know you're alone, and you're going to die soon, he said. I basically told him to get fucked and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. Next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40, with long stringy hair poking down and these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest damn butcher knife I've ever seen and made a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy and probably on drugs. He continued slamming his body against the glass, trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window, but managed to bust his head open, so the window now has blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for the cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him. And the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones, which caused my company cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on meth or something, because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores, but this is the last thing I need with this nut job running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass, over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones. He would at least be trapped or it would slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave and yelled the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl and then held up that knife again before running into the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows, and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang, and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't. And while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time, his hood had fallen back. He was bald-headed, with wild, long, stringy and crazy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge, and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, Die. Die. While making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later, the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looked like, and I told him I had camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone, 
and he'd driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy and that he would patrol the area and to call back if the guy came again. It was now nearly 5 a.m. when the cop left. I waited until 6 a.m. when it was broad daylight and people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. The guy literally took all 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8 a.m., I told her what happened, and she said they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after, but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or found out who he was. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to my channel members and patrons. Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.